is about a small country in the Middle East and its relationship with its neighbours. Originally known as Palestine, the British ruled it under a League of Nations mandate from 1922 after capturing it from the Turks in the First World War. Most of its population was Arab. They believed Britain had said that Palestine would be theirs. But the British had also promised the Jews a national home in Palestine. Making Jewish immigration easier was one of the conditions of the British mandate. And the Jewish population increased from about 80,000 in 1922 to over 400,000 in 1939. They worked hard to establish their farms and settlements throughout Palestine. But their arrival caused problems. The Palestinian Arabs bitterly resented ever-increasing numbers of Jews in what they believed to be their country and blamed the British. Amid mounting Arab hostility and rebellion, the British called a conference of Jews and Arabs in 1939. Although the Jews were promised ultimate independence, the British announced a cutback in immigration over the next five years. Then it was to stop altogether unless the Arabs agreed. Well, this was rejected out of hand by the Jewish leader, Ben-Gurion. For many Jews, including refugees from Hitler's Germany, Palestine was the only hope. So increasing numbers tried to get into the country, even though many would be refused entry when they got there. The British intercepted the ships carrying these illegal immigrants. Boat loads were brought ashore and put into detention camps before being sent back to Europe. The British were criticised for what many felt to be inhumane treatment of desperate refugees. So some Jews decided to take the law into their own hands and fight both the Palestinian Arabs and the British. They blew up the King David Hotel in Jerusalem in July 1946. It was the British military headquarters and over a hundred people were killed and injured. Jews and Arabs as well as British. This horrifying incident led to more Jewish and Arab violence and more detentions. Britain appealed to the United Nations who recommended partition, separate Jewish and Arab states. The Jews said yes, the Arabs no. Finally, on the 14th of May 1948, the British gave up their mandate and the State of Israel was proclaimed by Ben-Gurion, their first Prime Minister. Britain had been defeated by the problem. Would the new State of Israel do any better? One year later, Israel was to become a member of the United Nations. Formally declare Israel admitted to membership in the United Nations. But this was only after Israel had survived a violent attack by Arab states who believed Israel had no right to exist. In May 1948, Syria, Egypt and Transjordan attacked Israel from the north, the south and the east. But the Israelis fought back and managed to defeat the Arab forces. Fearful of Israeli reprisals, thousands of Palestinian Arabs fled from Israeli territory. They settled in camps just over the borders. Many expected they'd only be there for a short time, but they were wrong. With the war over, Israel had won her claim to exist. Now there were no limits to Jewish immigration. People were needed to build up the country. the new state's borders were with Arab countries, of which the most powerful was Egypt, immediately to the west. This country had been ruled since 1936 by King Farouk. At first he'd been popular, but the corruption of his governments and his way of life lost him general support. So on the 23rd of July 1952, the army revolted against the king. They expelled him, did away with the old political parties, and set up a republic under General Naguib. But the real power lay with Colonel Gamal Abdul Nasser, 
He soon replaced Naguib as president, and by 1954, he was the unchallenged leader of Egypt, determined to make it powerful and independent. Much of the country was poor and backward. Most Egyptians did not own the land they farmed. Nasser took over the rich landowners' properties and gave them to the peasants. This made him immensely popular. Many homes were primitive and overcrowded. Nasser rehoused thousands of Egyptians in modern blocks of flats. He took over a country where many had no proper medical care. So new clinics and hospitals were set up in many parts of Egypt. Much of Egypt's economy depended on an adequate and regular supply of water. But this was not always available or reliable. So one of NASA's most cherished projects was the giant Aswan Dam, designed to irrigate large areas of Egypt and provide hydroelectric power. NASA also wished to build up his military strength. When the West refused to give him what he wanted, he got weapons and planes from the Czechs. He denied Soviet influence, but Britain and America now refused money for Aswan. So the Suez Canal, owned by the British, was nationalized by NASA in July 1956 to give him the money he needed. This was to lead in October to the confrontation between Egypt, Britain and France, known in the West as the Suez Crisis, and by the Arabs as the tripartite aggression of Britain, France and Israel. Under a secret agreement with the French, who'd also involved the British, Israelis, in retaliation for many irregular attacks launched from Egypt, struck through Egypt's Sinai to reach the canal. They were highly successful, capturing many Egyptian prisoners. The British and French called for both sides to withdraw from the canal itself, which would have allowed the Israelis to stay in Sinai. When the Egyptians refused, Britain and France sent in their bombers and troops to force them out. But to ensure success, the British and French needed United States support. This the Americans were not prepared to give, as their president explained. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. We believe these actions to have been taken in error, for we do not accept the use of force as a wise or proper instrument for the settlement of international disputes. Without this support, the Suez operation was doomed to failure. Although the British Prime Minister, Anthony Eden, tried to put a brave face on it. We make no apology and will never make one for the action which we and our French allies took together. In November, United Nations troops took up their positions along the canal, replacing the British and French, who withdrew a few weeks later. Even the Israelis, who were much less ready to give up their territorial gains, were, in the end, persuaded to withdraw. For the Egyptians, the Suez affair made Nasser a national hero. To many outside Egypt, he became a symbol of resistance to Western colonialism and imperialism. He set up the UAR, the United Arab Republic, in 1958. The UAR joined Egypt and Syria together, but Egypt was by far the stronger partner. Nasser believed in the unity of all Arab countries, but with Egypt to lead them. He persuaded Russia to provide the money for the Aswan Dam. He seemed to be going from success to success. Soviet influence in Egypt grew. Their technicians and money helped to realize NASA's dreams of a modern, industrialized Egypt, more than ever well suited to lead the Arab world. But in spite of all appearances, NASA's prestige in the Arab world was beginning to decline. 
Many Arab countries were jealous of his claims to be their leader and spokesman. Egypt was spending more and more on weapons of all kinds, mostly from the Soviet Union. Nasser decided that these should be used to deter any future Israeli attack. He was also increasingly forced to demonstrate his hostility to Israel in an attempt to heal some of his conflicts with other Arab leaders. He began to prepare for the eventuality of war. In May 1967, amid growing tension, he ordered the United Nations, who'd been there since 1956, out of Egypt. The Egyptians then began to build up their forces in Sinai. Meanwhile, the Israelis had been building up their armed forces too. They were largely supplied from the West, particularly France. Their army was well-trained, tough and confident. Throughout May, the tension mounted. To the Israelis, it seemed that the Arab attack might come at any time. Then, at the end of May, King Hussein of Jordan came to Cairo to sign a defence agreement with Egypt. He was the last link in the Arab chain around Israel. June the 5th, the Israelis attacked. They sent their tanks in against Egypt, Syria and Jordan. Israeli planes struck the Egyptian air force on the ground. The Israelis swept through Sinai, driving the Egyptians back over the Suez Canal. It was a total disaster for the Egyptians. They lost over 10,000 men, 700 tanks, hundreds of guns, and nearly all their warplanes. And it was all over in six days. The Israelis captured the Arab-held old city of Jerusalem. General Moshe Dayan, the Israeli commander, came to see one of the most sacred Jewish monuments, the famous Wailing Wall. For the Israelis, it was a fitting climax to their triumph. But for the Palestinian Arabs, it was another story. Once again, as in 1948, thousands of refugees escaped across the River Jordan. Altogether, 400,000 fled from the territories occupied by Israel after the Six-Day War. They joined the other refugees in overcrowded camps, relying on rations largely provided through the United Nations. Some would remain there for a long time. After her victories in the 1967 war, Israel extended her borders. She now occupied Arab land in the north, east and the south, where Sinai was her biggest conquest. The Golan Heights were now under Israeli control. Previously, Syria had been able to threaten Israeli farm settlements. Now they were secure. But a new threat to Israel now developed. It came from among the Palestinian refugees in camps like these. Many had been living in the Arab countries bordering Israel for nearly 20 years. These countries didn't try to absorb the Palestinians on the grounds that it would make it difficult for them to claim that their real homes were in Israel. For nearly 20 years, the Palestinians relied on the Arab governments to help them return to their homes and support them in their fight against Israel. Then they decided to take the matter into their own hands, led by men like Yasser Arafat, who believed Palestinians had to fight to gain recognition. In the camps around Israel, groups were trained to carry the fight into that country. Regarded by many as terrorists, they thought of themselves as freedom fighters. Even their children who'd never seen Palestine were trained to fight Israel. 
The 1970s were the years of the terrorists. At Dawson's Field in Jordan to gain international recognition for their cause, Palestinians hijacked Western airliners and demanded the release of Palestinian prisoners. They were prepared to threaten the whole world. We will treat them in the same way their governments treat our own prisoners. The PFLP warns that any stupid intervention to free the hostages will only endanger their lives. The medical team of PFLP... If their demands were not met, they acted ruthlessly. In fact, their actions became so violent that in Amman, in Jordan, where the Palestinians outnumbered the Jordanians and appeared to be challenging the government, the army attacked and drove them out of the country after some bitter fighting. But the terrorist attacks continued, particularly on Israel. In May 1972, an attack on Lod Airport at Tel Aviv resulted in nearly a hundred killed and wounded. Then, in September, 11 Israeli athletes were murdered at the Munich Olympic Games. The Israeli response was always swift and ruthless. Places suspected of harboring terrorists were immediately destroyed. But in places like the Gaza Strip, many Palestinian Arabs continued to live under Israeli control. In an attempt to make Israel more acceptable, they were given work. Meanwhile, in Egypt, on the 28th of September, 1970, President Nasser died. He was still regarded by millions of Egyptians as their saviour. He was replaced immediately by President Sadat, who set about restoring Egyptian morale. He began by building up the army's self-confidence. Sadat was convinced that unless Israel was defeated, she would never withdraw from the territories she'd occupied in 1967. So on the 6th of October 1973, Egypt and Syria launched a surprise attack on Israel. Because it was a Jewish religious holiday, Israel was unprepared and the war was bitter with heavy casualties on both sides. The Arabs had fought better than ever before and made some gains, capturing a number of Israeli prisoners. But towards the end of the war, the Israelis succeeded in crossing the canal. During the fighting, both the Russians and the Americans poured in vast supplies of arms and equipment to both sides. However, the Arabs used one of their own weapons most successfully, oil. The Arabs supplied America and Western Europe with oil. Israel depended on Western support, especially weapons and money from America. When the 73 war began, Saudi Arabia tried to stop this Western support by doubling the price of oil and then cutting off supplies altogether to America and Holland. The war lasted 17 days. And at Geneva in 1973, Israel and her principal Arab opponents met for the first time to discuss the conditions of peace. The dangers of a confrontation between Russia and America had led them to impose a ceasefire on both sides. Only Syria stayed away. What was the outcome to be? We can make propaganda or we can try to make progress. The American attitude is clear. We know we are starting on a journey whose outcome is uncertain and, and whose progress may be painful. We are conscious that we need wisdom and patience and goodwill. But we know too that the agony of three decades must be overcome and that somehow we have to muster the insight and courage 
put an end to the conflict between peoples who have so often ennobled mankind.